Welcome to Shaz Barbaric with your host, Shaz Barbaric. Today we're going to continue the review of Shaz Barbaric's life and the development of his value system, so that way you can criticize him and call him an asshole, but at least you can do so with a foundation in reality and not just your pure imagination or opinion. So let us find the origination of assholery in the Shaz Barbaric. Vieques license. Vieques license, yes. Today is Thursday, December 6th. We had a good workout this morning. We, um, what else? We bought some groceries. My, my folks are out of town, so I have the house and the car to myself. What do I do with that? I do these videos, and I read. I might go see a Laker game. Not a Laker game, but go to a bar and see a Laker game tomorrow. Be careful, though, Shaz. That's how you got the DUI. If we're not learning from the past, then we're doomed to... I forget the rest of that quote. Puerto Rico. David A. McNerney. Yeah, I might see a Laker game tomorrow. What else might I do? It's raining outside. It's pretty loud. I would imagine these windows are closed. It's still pretty freaking loud. Anyways, that's also why it's a little dark. We're going to three hours of videos. Right now it's 2.06. We'll probably finish around 5, 5.30. Take little breaks. Do I have any water? I have a teeny bit of water. Oh, I drank too much coffee this morning. Not really supposed to be drinking coffee while you're working out, but coffee's a hell of a drug. Coffee and cigarettes are hell of drugs. People say, don't do drugs. What the fuck? We are surrounded by drugs. Don't do socially unacceptable drugs. Why are mushrooms, why are psychedelics socially unacceptable? Why is weed socially unacceptable? I think coffee and weed are very similar. Weed isn't as physically addictive as coffee. If you have a coffee habit, it's hard to wake up in the morning without coffee. I used to not drink coffee. Not as much. I drink a lot of coffee now. When you're working and you're used to just being in a grind, real estate and whatnot. Also meeting people. Coffee's a... You talk about deals over coffee and meals and shit, dates, coffee. Coffee's a way to mingle, talk to people. Tea, I was drinking a lot of tea too, though. I try to mix it up. Right now I'm back on the coffee grind. But yeah, weed you could pick up and put down easier. You're bored. If you're used to smoking all the time, you get bored when you're not always smoking because it makes life more interesting. But it's like... If you're thinking you're getting diabetes and you want to cut out salt, you might want the salt. You don't need the salt. You don't need weed. Coffee, though. Coffee's a hard one to put down, a lot harder than weed. I could put down weed just based off of stubbornness. All right, am I being too stony? Do I have context? Weed's good for brainstorming, but am I losing focus in, in my grind? Put down weed. Allow your clarity to return your clarity to return. Respect your sober mind. But coffee, I... Right now I put down weed for uh, six weeks now, seven weeks. When I came here, I had a lot. I smoked it all, like maybe a half ounce within a week. That's nice. When you're on one where you just want to stay lit, it's nice to smoke five, eight joints a day. Just I'm a little bit less high than I want to be. Now I'm all the way high again. As soon as you start coming down it's like no let's get lifted but then after that week that's why i smoked it all because my folks try to respect them in their house and so i'm like all right if i'm over here i'm not going to not going to be smoking as much although i mean i'll smoke openly with them not in their house but i'll be like i'm going for a walk I smoke a joint i'll be back because it's nice because then they grill me and then we can have a conversation and i can show them what a focused mind on weed is which is just pretty much a focused mind without weed, just, um, you have to spend a little bit more control, that's what, and then you come up with good ideas, interacting with people who are ignorant about drug use allows you to test your wisdom, your wisdom should be able to be tested against the world, 210 now, 210, Thursday, December 6th, yeah, I came up with this good saying, a trained mind you should be able to allow a trained mind off the leash, like a dog. 
in Santa Cruz, there's dog beaches, beaches where you can allow your dog off the leash. That allows your dog to socialize with other dogs. So if you never allow your dog off the leash or to socialize with other dogs, it could be growing up into an asshole dog, you don't even realize it. So from when they're young, like children too, dogs need to be socialized, brought around other dogs, given a little bit of freedom, and then you correct them. A good dog should walk next to you, not po pulling on the leash. This is stuff I've observed, but I'm pretty sure like the dog behavioralist also, Addie's, Addie's boyfriend is a dog behavioralist. They back me up on this. The, um, oh yeah, a dog should respect you and uh, follow you. You're the, the leader. Not, not like alpha bullshit, fucking like some of that stuff is silly. But just, you are a more tell intelligent, stronger animal than it, and it follows your guidance. You're the source of its shelter and its food, and it understands that. So sometimes it's more intelligent than you when you're in the wild. In other situations, the dog's picking up more information than you. And not that you should follow the dog, but pay attention to the dog, and it will tell you things. And my friend, she tripped out with her dog on mushrooms, and the dog looked at her like, now you get it. Just kind of looked at her like, like she, not that she was stupid, but like, hmm, okay. So sometimes you get high, stoned with your animals, and see if you can kind of pick up their intelligence. They have an intelligence. By the literal definition of the word, they have a way in which they view the world that they process and then make decisions based off of those processing mechanisms. And you can understand them, and then that's dog behavior, how to train them and stuff. There's human ways that we interpret the world. Also, what's really cool is that dogs are found at the earliest sites of human, modern behavior, behaviorally modern humans, what, 50,000 BC. So dogs have been with us for a while. Maybe weed too, nicotine, these things that interact with our brain. I like that. I like to have friends, evolutionary friends who followed with us. Cats are more modern, and that might be why we're still making friends with cats. Cats came out of maybe ancient Egypt, maybe like two, 3,000 BC. We never really domesticated them. It takes a while to domesticate an animal like we've done with dogs to develop a, a symbiotic relationship, which is nonverbal. Cats, it's like we're still just hanging out at a mortician, not a mortician, they worked in the morgue, something with dead people in New York, a client, when I was doing roommate matching for a little bit, and there's a couple startup companies that went after that market in Manhattan. I was doing it like 2013, 14. For a whole summer I did it, not realizing how much money you can make just doing normal brokering. I was fucking busting my ass. I would make over 10000 a month. I started to hit my stride, but I was working way too hard, and then after that I decided only... Um, Two to three thousand dollar one bedroom apartments or studios, no more roommates. We're working three roommates, possible guarantors on each roommate. Guarantors are the people who guarantee the lease. And if those guarantors are their parents and I need documents from both sets, I have three times two, two parents each, six people's documentation. So even if you're making three, four thousand dollars on a three bedroom apartment, it's a lot of moving parts. And now this person doesn't want to provide their stuff or this husband is uncomfortable providing his tax return. It's the more moving parts, the more possibility that something breaks. One roommate, especially I was matching random strangers, one roommate drops out, now I have to find another roommate that is compatible. It would take about 10 people. So when I found three people who liked each other, I would count on at least one, two dropping out, and I'd still be working hard. So that way when someone does drop out, I already have a replacement. They still have to have a vibe. and doing business the right way. We're not strong arming people into this. Now we have to meet, make sure that they get along. We'd have little powwows. This is where communication and character comes into play. Since I've developed, I've tried to develop a word and character. People trust me to connect other people. And I have these girls who never knew each other, but you, they might as well have gone to the same sorority together. They are all very similar and they loved each other. I did that a couple times. So human behavior makes you money. The, the knowledge of human behavior. The knowledge of dog behavior makes you friends. Puerto Rico. This is where I learned a little bit about human behavior. Look at this picture. I look like a beautiful man. David A. McNerney. Bravos de Boston. Vieques, Puerto Rico. Boston Braves. They named the neighborhood Boston Braves. Let me describe this. 
the um, what I would do on these tours. I went down there. My friend, she was living there. Oh, no, no, let's catch up. Ten minutes into this. First video of the day. First video of three we'll do today. Let's catch up. I was in um, my parents' house making those... What did I do? What was the progression? Um, California Citizens Audit. Abandoned that. Ran out of money. Sent Shaw home. We had a fight. I have to acknowledge my relationship, maturity. I wasn't quite communicating honestly. Um, instead of breaking up with someone honestly, you pick a fight and then that pushes you away. That's not an honest way to do it. You should Honesty is the best policy. It's silly, but do right, fear no man. If you uh, don't do the hard thing, then you might be instilling some bad behaviors, bad habits. So every relationship I've had, I try to be more honest than the last. Uh, within reason. Sometimes it's just emotional vomiting when you're just dialoguing everything but if you want to feel if you feel like you're break you want to break up with someone have that honest discussion don't be passive aggressive blah 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 so there's a time for passive aggressivity aggressiveness and and games as tactic and strategy to be able to um yeah, games of, of tactics and strategy, games of competition. But that's a relationship is a cooperative endeavor. It's not a competitive endeavor. That's why passive aggressivity. Ask aggressivity. I never really liked that when people were like, you're being passive aggressive. It's like, well, it depends on the context. Yeah, if this is a time of vulnerability, we're trying to open each other up emo emotionally, then yeah, definitely that ego and that competition needs to lower. But if we're trying to get the best out of each other, let's, this is, if, if, if I have a client, I'm representing that client. That's a time when you use your word and your character and everything. But now in representing that client, I'm going against another agent or I'm guiding that client through getting an apartment or something where we're trying to save them money or just protect them from getting screwed. Then now I'm using every tactic at my disposal in my awareness of human nature. And that's where, you know, you can be aggressive, aggressive. You know, I said, you know, there's going to be one video. I already, I didn't say, you know, in one of these, but. So, um, yeah, nah, in combat and business in competitive fields, you use every tool at your disposal. And, um, sometimes it's effective to, um, to what, how would you, would be an example of passive aggressiveness in business? I think there's a lot of Zen that's like using people's momentum against them. It's just, uh, being aggressive through noncompliance through, um, Letting people push you, just kind of, um, there's this saying, one of my cousins, um, my mom warned me about, just big family. She has 10 brothers and sisters, so we have hundreds of cousins, extended family. She was like, oh, they like to play country dumb. You try to negotiate with them, talk to them, or something about money. I think I was going to buy a truck from them back in the day. She's like, yeah, they're going to play stupid. They're going to, so just make sure you're clear about stuff. That's a form of passive aggressiveness in business. Just playing stupid to let the other person reveal their hand, and it's just it's it's playing your strength in a passive way. That's not a bad thing. But relationships again, if they're always negotiations, then and that's it's not a it's not it's it's a it's not a hard line because it is a negotiation in the sense that I have my life I've lived up to now and my values I've tried to protect and my character. This other person, I have to let them know what I'm willing to compromise on and what I'm not. But in a in a dialogue, it's more of a dialogue than a competition. When relationships feel competitive, then there's the cultures, the whatever it is you're creating is starting to become toxic. It's a plant. I think that's a really good metaphor. Water it, give it sunlight, give it love and affection and attention. Talk. Plants. You don't pull a plant up, or you'll uproot it. So, ego, and force, and expectation, anything you. That's not how you grow things. You nurture. You nurture things. That's how you grow them. And the more relationships, I guess, we have in this world that require nurturing, or the more, yeah. If you can have your relationships based off of that metaphor of nurturing, gardening, as many as you can, that would be good. But not naive. There are a lot of interactions in this life which require competition. I guess that's why I set up that philosophy, that six-stage philosophy, six levels. And the bottom one's animalistic. 
that's as com competitive as it gets because and that's where in Vieques I got to practice that that is the wild and then you go up that's a blue one then you go up to the purple one of deceit where through your efficiency you're able to carve out a little bit of space for yourself to think because if you're just competing animal to animal it's like you're stealing food from wolves or you're out there building your own shelter now we have civilization and technology and we have ways to multiply our efforts I would call that deceit, but that's just a funny way to phrase it. I say, um, yeah, I, I said it in a, a later work, which is pretty good. And then after that, you're in the space to play, explore yourself sexually, personally, artistically, all the things that express your nature that aren't purely for survival, but for other expressions. And then uh, the reason why I put willpower and ego above that is because it seems like the human animal has a desire to have a trade I haven't been able to turn that off. Everywhere I've gone, when I was in Mexico, I was, I was writing, I was doing the amnesty book, but I also picked up a job teaching English to executives. Since I could speak somewhat well, I didn't have any lesson plan, but I found a company that was small. The guy talked to me, he liked who I was. I didn't have any degrees or credentials, but he saw that I was articulate. So I would just buy The Economist. I told them I'll buy a high level magazine, just read it with them and have them read it. And then we'll discuss the grammar and shit, the grammar and shit. They just, everyone in Mexico, especially executives, people who have good educations, have been taking English since they were in elementary school. It's the it's the language of international commerce, but they haven't practiced as much with native speakers. So this was a small company that would send a native speaker to these corporations, and I'd talk to the high higher members of those corporations. So Deloitte, I went to Deloitte. Um, Deloitte's nat global and. Um, they paid for it, Deloitte, to help their um, people practice their English. And so there's a group of them in the mornings we would go, like 8 or 9 in the morning, sit in one of the conference rooms and read The Economist. I was reading The Economist since... I was reading The Economist before they had color and pictures and glossy magazines. In Speech and Debate, 1997, 98 to 2000. And then when I was in the military, 2001 to... They switched over to be a glossy Newsweek type magazine. And they went, they meant mainstream. But back in the day, it was something that, just like vital speeches of the day, magazines that only speech and debate nerds read, which I wasn't, but I peeked in that door. I peeked in many doors. Peeked in that door, peeked in, uh, what else? Fucking ditched school a bunch, yeah. Yeah, my senior year, I just got fucking kind of tired of it. So, um, why did I bring that up? Mexico. I was in Mexico. Oh, yeah, the impulse to make money. So when I was down there, I was like, I was making, writing the amnesty book, but I've always acknowledged there's these other aspects of my personality I can't really turn off, which must be inherent in human behavior. Maybe they're more, they exhibit more in me, but they, um, this relates to Puerto Rico. I saw this down there, too. There's a natural proclivity to grow businesses. There is this industrial part of human nature if I, I acknowledge my and that's why i split it up into six sections because i don't know if one of these is more important than the other there is a hierarchy you want peace at the top you want your more animalistic nature at the bottom but i've read a little bit over my life and i see people proposing that we're just animalistic darwinian social darwinian societies of survival of the fittest which isn't really true but we're not merely just cooperative either there is an ego part of us that likes to grow a business and i see that when i read these biographies of these titans of industry steve jobs and the from pixie to pixar and beyond is a really good one because that's a book about apple but it's not by or strictly about steve jobs so it's about pixar and his interaction with them because there's a whole cult of personality around uh, Mr. Job's. So this was actually written by a Buddhist. That's where Zen Buddhism rears its ugly head again. Um, ch -ch -ch. So yeah, so I put the orange, the ego, the desire. And also, if you think about it, think about the progression of your own thought or anyone's thought. This is how it's shown in my life. And over, like when I was in Mexico, and then when I went to Puerto Rico, the same thing. It's, first, if you have the most amount of anxiety and the I mean, this is kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I always kind of related to as well. If you have a lot of instability, you just want comfort and security and roof over your head. That's an animal nature. 
But in order to get ahead to that joyful, playful side, you, you got to have a step ahead of the animal nature. You can't just be competing every day. And you see this in poor neighborhoods too. I see that they never really escape the, the primal animalistic. Every, you're so stressed out and you're, you're so anxious, you play a little bit, but then the luckiest among them get enough space through getting their own job, owning their own thing, entrepreneurial spirit, Jeffersonian democracy, having your own little farm, your own little bit of land, a country of rugged individualists with their own autonomy. Then after that, I put plants and partners, the wisdom of the other, because now that you've turned that ego on in order to grow the business, my yellow section is to, um, to now, you need the break. If you're pure, and that's my biggest fault when I read these guys and the money they've made is they think that being driven is the best thing in the world. But I can point out the fallacies in Warren Buffett's life and his family and his relations and his personal, his values and his ethics, how he's made the money. He's not, he didn't round out that spiritual side of it. And his, his relationships with, with, them, with women are questionable. Not who am I to judge, but there's efficient and less efficient ways to interact. If you want to ring the, reach those higher rungs of love, higher rings of love, whatever you call it, but like, if you want to experience all the things that a human life have to offer, I think this six-step philosophy is, for me so far, is a good way for me to have a shorthand. Then I can discuss it right now, and there's a framework. Then after that, after you explore the, um, and then I'm starting to find the science that backs us up, explore the ways to, uh, to, I guess, interact with your default mode network would be your part of your consciousness, which gives you your, your framework that you put all the rest of the data into. So in order to edit that, you need something that does the opposite of objectification, which is spirituality. I am another you, uh, which is the, I think that was Mayan term for it, the idea of the spiritual and other people and plants and animals. And that oneness that you get from psychedelics, you also get that from love from unifying your spirit with someone else. And then you also get that from, um, from faith, I think. Religion, psychedelics, and love all tap into this part of your brain which allows you to chill that ego. Because what I've noticed is when you feed it, in order to grow a business, what I was doing in five, six years in real estate in New York, King Kong gang got shit on me. I could just feel it. When I made a good commission, if I made over $10,000 in the first 10 days of the, of the month, I counted it in my notes. I have like, my hourly rate, like if I counted how many hours I worked this week, honestly, like, all right, I did like maybe 60 hours. I was really grinding. I was, even when I go to the gym and everything, my phone's always on. I don't count those as hours worked when I'm at the gym, but I have to count that. All right, out of that hour at the gym, I spent like 10 minutes there working. And I um, then I got home and I spent an hour or two doing a market analysis for that person. So I would do like maybe 60 hours or so, not never more than that, but I would do more than full time when I was really grinding those first couple days of the month, that first 10 days, 12 days, when really all the clients are out. We have a cyclical market. 50% of our leads come out the first seven days. And then another, uh, was it 25% come out the next week. So the last two weeks of the month, we only get a quarter of our leads. So three-fourths of our leads are coming out that first 50 days, and they're really front-loaded those first three to five days. So if you're not eye on the ball, you miss the largest percentage the meat of the market which is fine because sometimes you're not making money because you have too much stuff going on so when it slows down now you can be more selective it's all about picking the winners so sometimes you're trying to do too much and then you're not giving everyone the individual attention so even when it's slow if you're focused then that guy comes along but you grab him because there was nothing else so as soon as he came on you're able to give him the attention he deserved because within like the first couple contacts someone picks their broker and that person who wanted to pay someone a fee in order to solve a problem for them, they're the, the unicorn, the, the, the golden ticket. Everyone else you have to talk into or you have to cut your fee or this and that. So I only look for those guys. But those guys out of a month of 30,000 agents in the city, not everyone's eating. So maybe like 10, 20,000, uh, maybe, I don't know. How many apartments? There's over 100,000 apartments a month in Manhattan, I think. Not all of them are renting within 30 days, especially not now the market's slowing down. But maybe you have tens of thousands of clients out there. I would say like less than 10% of them are. Well, I would my numbers are 1% to 3% of the raw contacts were people I was closing. So that shows you right there. 1 to 3 out of every 100 were people that I 
would fit within my system. A lot of fish, and a lot of a lot of them swimming through my nets, but my nets were designed only to catch the right ones. So what I noticed, oh, and then the last part of my philosophical Shaz explains the world and himself system, is the green one, the spiritual. It's above the, not spiritual, it's the peace. It's the God has no name, the meditative, quiet, stillness, silence. It's not a, the top of my system isn't love, it isn't faith, it isn't drugs, it isn't jobs, it isn't play, it isn't cleverness, it isn't the wild. It's the, the peace that you're born with and that allows you to die, allows you to face death with dignity and honor, all those other great characteristics. It's a culmination of a life well lived. And um, yeah, and silence, wisdom is silence. The appearance of wisdom is transparent intention, but true wisdom is uh, peace. And peace allows you to be silent and allow the world to reveal itself to you. Allows you to honestly question because you truly know nothing and you truly are just... No, not even that. Because the seeker would be the second below. Yeah, even curiosity is a lack of peace, right? Peace just is. And my highest forms of consciousness, I feel like I just, I just am. I am that dog with his fucking mile long gaze just chilling any animal the piece of any animal expressing itself as a natural part of this world as a cog in the machine that bird is a part of that ecosystem and it doesn't stop and say am i a bird am i being enough bird am i birding enough did today did i bird up to my bird standards no it's just a bird we can do that Human beings can just be a human being. You have to understand yourself. And that way when your expressions come out, you don't fight them. And you have context for them. So I guess that's what that six level system is. So when my expressions come out, I have a context for them. Oh, this is my animalistic side or my playful side. or my. And then there's a reason why. And I know that. So if I want to keep in that green higher level, I make sure all those other levels have a context. Um, so, yeah, when I was in Mexico, I was like, wow, I can't really turn off this entrepreneurial spirit. It's a part of who I am. Working for that guy in that translation company, after like a week or two, I was like, well, shit, I want to start my own company. It's the ego. It's like some of us can't work for other people. And then I tried to get on the phone and start drumming up clients, and it's paid by the minute down there because of Carlos Slim owns all the telecommunications. And then you realize, oh, this is what makes Mexico a third world country. When I drink the water, I get diarrhea. And when I try to start a business, uh, the family I'm living with, my uncle, they don't have unlimited phone lines. If you restrict communication, you restrict an economy. It's the same thing with New York, I would think. If we just made the subway free, we would open up transportation. I'm pretty sure it'd be a net positive. Some of these things that are just logical, you can run the numbers on them. Give people the, the means to communicate freely, and then the economy... The facilitation of the transfer of goods and services are gonna you're gonna lubricate the economy, I would imagine. I'm just one data point. One guy who down there thought about starting business and then it was cost prohibitive. Then some guy gave me a cell phone, he wanted to go in with me. He was a professor. Professor de ventas, vendedor, uh, professor of sales. He said sales is a is a philosophy or something. It's a science. He really liked me. We had some conversations, he really saw a lot of good in me. And then I guess I just a bit of a dipshit, which doesn't make me, makes me feel less bad about firing people or not working with people because I've had that happen to me. And I told the guy who was working with me, I was just like, I don't see your character, man. You got to work on some shit. I was like, people have told me that in my life. And I just, you can argue with me or you can look in the mirror, but I got to call it. I, some of the stuff, the ways he was communicating with me, I was like, nah, you're not. I've learned those lessons and I don't got the time to teach them to you. So live life and we're going to link up again. Nothing personal. I'm saying it because I respect you. That you need to learn lessons that I can't give you. And that professor in Mexico, he didn't tell me that. He just gave me a cell phone, and after a week or two, he stopped contacting me. I said, do you want the cell phone back? He was like, no, keep it. I was like, I, I, I think I fucked this one up. But I wasn't meant to stay in Mexico. I was bouncing around. I had a, um, I should talk about an embarrassing story about a girl down there. 
hanging out with the street people, writing my poetry. There's this guy who would take a tile. He was from Argentina, so I was hanging around with an artist in Guadalajara. He would paint on the tile with his fingers and then sell them on the street. And then I wrote, I wrote some really good poems. I wrote um, Canto Quere Ser Luz over there. I have to find that in Spanish. The song wants to be light. In his darkness, he will try to hold the moon inside his melody, but the light doesn't know what she wants to be. She just finds her limits like the water that she rides. Up the shore and back again. Something, something. Yeah, I had it in Spanish. I wrote in Spanish first. And this girl would come by. She was really cute. She had a, a kid, as a lot of pretty girls do in poorer countries. They they learn, but they learn after after the kid. And uh, we all went dancing one night. They, so the guy who painted on tiles was like, when is this? So I'm talking about I went to Puerto Rico, but this is like three, four years. So this is like my first Latin American country experience when I wrote Amnesty. After Addy made my brain crazy, I was like, I need to get out of here. I need to leave the country. Heartbreak, tragedy. Down there, still with the same heartbreak, tragedy. So this cute girl's coming by, and I'm asking her opinion to on the street while I write my poetry and the guy paints on his tiles. That was a good month we were doing that, or at least a couple weeks. I had quit that translating job. And at night, I would sleep on the roof and, and write my poems and my notes for, for amnesty. But during the day, I would go hang out with these guys downtown Guadalajara with all the tourists. So one night, he's like, let's go. Uh, we're going to get drunk. We're going to have fun. I was like, awesome. So um, I followed him back home. He lived in these uh, apartments with, like, the trannies and the prostitutes and the fucking... Um, you're not supposed to say tranny anymore. Why are other people's opinions in my head right now? But uh, he lived with all the fucking, you know, the street people. They were paying a couple hundred bucks for their rooms. It was like this huge common, like, colonial fucking courtyard with all these little rooms everywhere. And you fucking heard, like, just uh, Mexico, Latin American countries in general, especially with that Catholic culture and that sexual repression. There's a counter. There's a red light district. And there's a lot of prostitutes. And there's a lot of uh, homosexual, transsexual, alternative sexuality. So the more you repress sexuality, you find, usually, in my experience, the more it comes out in other ways. And so this artist lived among them. It was really cool. So I was, like, walking to his room, but you see, like, pretty sure dudes, but, like, putting on their drag and their makeup. And because everyone's pretty much open, they're all facing out into this courtyard with all these rooms. That would have been a whole nother life if I stayed down there and lived with him. Lived with him. I had the opening. He really liked me because I was the poet. He was the artist. That's a, I've taken these bus rides from California, from L.A. to San Francisco and with a bunch of Burning Man types and you have the guy playing flute and beatboxing. These videos that are on YouTube that YouTube took away from me. And you had other types and druggies and blah, blah, blah. And not druggies, but the people who, that's their thing, heavily psychedelics. And I'm over there reading my philosophy and they call me the philosopher. I'm like, that's our philosopher. So down there I was the poet. And then this girl, I could tell she was she liked me, even though I was still trying to figure out how girls liked me, and then um, or how to tell when girls liked me. And then went out dancing, and then I just remember I got shit face, and I tried to dance with her, and I didn't go to prom, so I was still learning how to dance. Took a couple girlfriends and a couple like, all right, yeah, Shaw, Shaw was a good eye opener for that. Oh shit, I didn't tell that story. Shaw, me and her friend who later became a, a junkie for a little bit. She's good now, I think. Me and th I'm taking them. We're all going to the city. And me and Shah had just started dating. But Shah's the spirit, this dominatrix spirit, back then before I brought her to California. And um, she... Um, <laughs> she was being... Rowdy. She was rowdy. She was very rowdy. She's still domineering, dominatrixing. And uh, so we're getting drunk. We're drinking a little bit on the train, as you can do in New York if you're subtle. And then she's like, woo, and she's getting up, and she's uh, she starts giving people lap dances on the train. And um, uh, fucking the phone's calling. It might be my folks are on the road right now. They're driving up to Humboldt to... Uh, yeah, they're driving up to Humboldt to see my dad's mom because she might pass soon. She just, they just put her in hospice care. Today is um, December, Thursday, the 6th. So Shah is um, giving people lap dances, and 
I tell the friend, I'm like, oh yeah, that's my girlfriend right there. Just kind of like, it could have gone both ways. And I, I heard myself talking. It was like, oh, that's my girlfriend right there. I could have been like, oh man, what the fuck is she doing? Like judgmental? But Addy taught me that doesn't get you anywhere. I was very judgmental with Addy. So I was like, yeah, that's my girlfriend right there. I was like, oh, that's my girlfriend right there. So I fucking, I, if you can't, you know, what is it? Don't sulk in a dance bar. Don't dance in a dive bar. This was a dance bar. So fucking, you got to just, your mind cycles through things, ways that you would react to a situation. And that's, I think, what love does. It allows you the strength or just, you care enough to be like, let me try something different. Usually I would be fucking like, oh, you know, she's being wild and crazy. Or like, there's a lot of different ways you could react to that. You could be like, oh, you're so crazy, which I think is a little cheesy. Well, you're so crazy. Or I could be like, oh, man, you're not really acting like my girlfriend. You're giving other people lap dances on the train. But what I was like is like, well, I guess I'll join them. So I jumped up and I started giving this dude a lap dance. <laughs> and the difference is she, um, so I just got a little crazier. That's what sometimes is you, you one up the crazy. Um, she was giving a gay guy, obviously gay, a lap dance because he was like, woo, you go girl. And she was on him and she was grinding on him getting all that dominatrix energy out and he was like woo and he was like yeah girl and so it was totally non-threatening anyways the guy was like it was all a big playful new york city train ride experience which you have many of those when you're there but then i jumped up on an obviously like dude who's just trying to have his train ride and i was like yeah what's up and then fucking he was just like this he was just like please don't please don't what are you doing please don't <laughs> i was just it was so funny it was like i was like and then like they started cracking up i was like all right improve myself a little bit it's like you got the sexy i got the crazy i think we can make this work that's just if you want if you want a wild girl if you want a girl with spirit you can't you you don't have to be i was with the dancer girl she would always make fun of me we'd be dancing she was like you move too much i was like what type of fucking dance instructor are you because she taught salsa and other shit on the side she made her money like five different jobs I was like, you don't, that's such terrible advice. You move too much. That's, you don't tell someone that. You're supposed to fucking teach people how to dance. I move fucking how I want. And she was like, uh, but whatever, but you do it. You, your spirit, my spirit, you have to be able to bring it up. And, but you, that's like the same as fucking when people make fun of you for your look, being hairy, being whatever. You got to own it. I met many people in my life who own it. And um, yeah, every fucking goofy ass, funny ass person who owns their individuality is another person that's showing the rest of us freaks how to how to do it. I love it. That's that's another reason why. Around my friends too, you raise your spirit up to let them know just be yourself. I got you. My spirit will be big enough to protect us all. I will be a goofy enough motherfucker that you can all be lesser shades of goofy within my larger fucking sphere. I went to the house of yes, some fucking bougie like the scene and not the scene but People are like, oh, it's like the Studio 54 of our generation shit. I, and those people are fucking uptight in my book. They're fucking, but whatever. They are what they are. They're like, they have a sign in there. No blowjobs on the dance floor. Which is implied that the bathroom's okay. Because they got their sexy corners where you can go. And I went into their hot tub before. I think I said that story. But yeah, I got dressed up as a... Uh, I dressed up in a leotard in some woman's costume and had my girlfriend do my makeup up. Just fucking... Just own it. Push your presence out there. Did I say that story about... Yeah, I dressed up in my friend's dress once and went there on mushrooms and then we got in a fight and I had to kind of like walk around Brooklyn in a dress, threw my money away. I was all... Yeah, that was a weird fucking night. That's going to go in like some writing shit, so I don't got to explain that. Anyways. Shaz, where'd your confidence come from? Well, sometimes in your life, you just got to decide that I'm going to not do the thing that I usually do. And I'm going to try to do something else. In, Ber in Berkeley, when I lived there, when I was 22, 23, I was at this party. And the band that I used to hang out with, they were playing at that party. The Misfit cover band. It was Halloween, and they were playing Halloween Misfit song. They're pretty good, too. They're as good as the Misfits, pretty much. Which I isn't saying much. They're an okay band. They're, they're a good band. But, um, yeah, they were fucking, the kids were like, everyone was like, all right, who wants beer? And they were trying to, there's the line for the beer and the fucking, the keg and shit. And I stood up on some ledge and I was like, I want beer. 
I, no one knew me. So they just looked at me, and I was like, and I slowly stood down, climbed down. It was like, it was dead, it was crickets. They were like, some girl was trying to rile up their line, like, all right, who wants beer? And I stood up onto the ledge, and I was like, I want beer. Okay, I'm going to get down now. And I'm like, oh, I, I guess it's more, you got to know people. I don't know anyone. I'm, I don't go to college. I'm at a college party in Cal Berkeley, but there's other stuff going on. And then I start to say, think, what is cool? Is cool just a fucking, is it, does it even exist? But then you start developing a philosophy of cool. That's something. I have a philosophy of sex, a philosophy of philo philosophy, of philosophy, a philosophy of sales. Cool is not giving a fuck. And so cool means that like cool doesn't belong to you. My cool belongs to me. And I'm just, I'm always cool. It's not when when you when you put cool onto like what society or culture thinks. That's not. It's like oh just fucking that's not cool. That's when what cool is not being able to be made self conscious, and that takes a certain way of living and a confidence in your ability and your your um, yeah and just life. So so going to Puerto Rico gave me a lot of confidence too in my experiences there, which allowed me to, I think, be cooler because I have a context about myself and what I've been through and people I've met. And so <laughs> let me talk about Puerto Rico. What's cool about this license, other than the amazing picture? Uh, my friend, she went to the DMV there and she started talking about me like, oh yeah, uh, something. She said something because it's, Vieques has 10,000 people. There's about a thousand expatriates, so it's a very small community. Maybe a couple hundred that go out and go to the bars and stuff. Even less than that, it gets small quick. So the people at the DMV on the island were like, oh, "I know that guy. He's the one with the crazy picture." So this is a good picture. I had a mustache, my hair. I'm growing it out again. It was pretty long. I was wearing a Hawaiian shirt, and look at how beat up it is. It went in the ocean so many times. I was a tour guide, so I, I went there. My friends are living down there. Let's let's catch this up. 18 minutes. Sometimes I feel like I just need to get out whatever's in my head. Um, I'm living at my parents' house in River, Riverside. Uh, I think Riverside, off the 215. Yeah, we had moved from Redlands. They bought a house, the house that they would later on lose in the recession um, in 2011. When I was in Occupy Wall Street, they were getting evicted. Well, that's very topical, right? Uh... So, but I was living there. Shaw came out for a Christmas. It was really nice. We reconciled a little bit. She, um, my mom was like, she's not sleeping in your room, okay? She tried to make her sleep down the hall. I was like, no, we don't play that. I was always trying to be upfront with my folks about like, yeah, your values, my values, but we're not gonna, I, but some people, like my brother's like, you're being disrespectful. It's like, nah, I think there's more problems if we don't fight this battle now. If I just pretend like we're cool with you, passing your values on to my sexuality. Like, I'm a grown-ass man. I'm 20, what is it, eight years ago. I'm 28. I'm living at my parents' house, and some people might say, well, and that's what my brother said. It's their house. you got to live by the rules. I was like, we're adults and we're having sex. I'm not going to pretend like we're not having sex. I'm just, she's going to sneak down to my room. I'm going to sneak down to her room. She came out here to have sex with me. We're, we're visiting for the holidays, but a large part of that is this is a conjugal visit. Well, we're going to fucking, we're going to get a hotel. We're going to fuck in the yard. No, I'm sorry. You're, you got your head in the sand, Christianity. People don't have sex. I was like, sometimes when she would talk about homosexuality and my brother, I'm like, do you even do you care if I fuck girls in the ass? Like, what are we talking about? We were talk you're mad that he's attracted to men, or are you mad about the anal sex? Am I allowed to have anal sex as a heterosexual male? Let's get into the specifics. What are we? Oh, stop it! You're embarrassing me. Blah blah blah. And then when her and my dad were going through it, and he's being a dumbass and they lived apart for a little bit. I was telling her, we're going to get a nice Italian man for you. I think you need, you probably have a, a high sex drive. It's genetic. I know I do. I think our family is just, we're, we're fiery people. So we're going to find you a nice Italian who could satisfy you. She's like, oh, shut up, shut up. Try, talk, talking to your parents openly about sex, especially if it's a very taboo subject, is interesting. Some people would say it's very uncomfortable, but... I'm like a David Blaine of uncomfortability, or whatever you would call it. I try to, because it's only made our relationship stronger. Sometimes I cross the line. A lot of times I do, but then 
that's why that's how you become friends with your parents that's a hard thing when you're younger they're your parents but once you're both adults living in the same house it's a little silly because but after i did real estate i had my i paid for the car for like a couple of years and i still am going to do many more things for them but um, it's okay to take the comfort and shelter with each other because we're sharing time and memories like my dad's going up there to see his, his mom pass and she's 80 she's 92 in this society we feel like we have to be so individualistic that that's more important than the time we share i saw this quote by um larry david's daughter she said my dad's gonna die eventually why not live with him so i could soak up his existence while he's here that might be extreme to live with him forever but it's we it's the opposite of how the society is Mo grow up, move out, and then put them in a hole when they get sick. That's not Latin American culture. That's, it's or Asian culture. Take care of your parents. Let's live together. Let's, and that might be too much too, but I knew I was going to come back home, and I'm glad I'm here now because I knew I was going to spend a couple months this year with him because every now and then in my life I feel like I should do that, get to know them, reaffirm our friendship. And it's a friendship because we have our silly things, we have our fights, we, we have the times that I go too far. And I call my mom Mama G. We got uh, nicknames. Uh, sometimes she doesn't like me cursing. And I'd be like, during that period, right before I went to Puerto Rico, I'd have, because my dad, he, um, he bounced for a little bit for a couple months doing his own thing. And then they reconciled. So I, that's one of the reasons also I stayed in her house. Didn't want her living by herself. Stuff like that. Our women. That's my mom. She gave me life. I, um, there's ways you can give back to your family with money, but you can always give love and time. You can't get to know someone without time. Time is the first important thing. That's why I try to tell other people too. Is if you want to love someone, love is an embrace. Spend time with them. It's not the words. Love isn't an argument. Love isn't the right answer. It's just spend a month, spend two months with them, and your personalities will develop, and you'll have silly conversations and. My mom, I would make her blush. I'd be like, we're going to get you a nice Italian man. And you don't even know the types of things that they do to their women. <laughs> She's like, oh my gosh, shut up, shut up. But she would smile because this conservative Christian can't speak like that. She's not even allowed to think like that. But what I've learned, and that also helped me understand those types of people, it doesn't mean that they don't have a sex drive. It doesn't mean that they don't want to experience life. They just, they, they don't, that's why they always tell dirty jokes and other shit. They don't, think that they should be the ones to talk about it but they love like that's the suppression the more you suppress it the more it wants to come out they love the dirty friend they love the that's why they had this guy embezzle money from them they themselves wouldn't steal but then that's why they voted for trump they feel like in this world you need someone who would steal who would be mean and tough i just read this book the authoritarians people like that who follow religion and authority figures feel like there should be a strong presence out there to protect them but they just also feel like they're not that presence or the gentle meek they're the sheep and they need the shepherd so i sometimes not to be an asshole but i just try to puff myself up a little bit to let her know she has a strong son that's all and a silly son and a, yeah they're not here so maybe that's why i'm thinking about them so sha got there and she was like she's not sleeping in her room and I'm like, hey, you know what? You can't fucking stop me. So it is what it is. Enjoy her company. And she did. We all had a lot of fun because that's what it is. She could get mad at me. And she tried to turn that into a fight a couple times. I'm like, no, nah, we had a good time. Don't twist it like that. She's a very beautiful woman. And she's the first one I brought around the house for the holidays especially. And she's Latin. She's, she's Ecuadorian and Honduras. Or no, Nicaragua and Honduras. So... They, her and my mom were cooking shit. She, she cooks amazingly. Her mom is an amazing cook. So Sean and my mom were in the kitchen, and that's a very Latin American thing. Let the women do their thing. Um, my pops was around at that time, so me and my pops were just hanging out. It was a good little, like, pretend marriage. And then she went back just to show my folks that it could happen. It might not be this girl, but it could happen. I'm not. Because I think parents worry. Are you going to give me grandkids? Are you going to get married? And even though I'm still taking my time to decide those things. I just wanted to show them that it's not a lack of sociability. Like, cause I think they were a little worried me getting into my twenties. Maybe this guy is too much of a hermit or a recluse. It's like, no, it's a choice. That's why I wanted to make sure the world understood. It's a, 
my path is funny, but it is a choice. I do have these other options if I wanted to take them. And then me and Shai had the quietest little mouse in the church sex that you can imagine as to not disturb or irritate my parents down the hall. We had a good little time. And after that, I'm making these music videos or these videos. And I've written, I've written these things, but I'm like, all right, these projects, there's wisdom that I don't have yet that I feel I need in order to round them out. I need to read Anarchist Theory, which I'm doing now, but I'm only doing it now because I've lived Anarchist Theory, which I'm realizing Occupy Wall Street was anarchism in action a lot. As I read about the first internationalists in the 1800s, uh, workers of the world for the first time trying to get together to counteract the effects of global capital and, and um, statism, I'm recognizing a lot of issues we had in Occupy Wall Street between those who wanted to centralize authority, which would be the democratic socialists back then, or the anarchists, who you can't bring them anywhere because all they want to do is devolve authority, but then that gets us nowhere. So they're a good corrective measure, and they're a good check, but they're also easy to criticize because, fuck, if you can get them, like, <laughs> at one of their international meetings, their only statement was that, and it drew, like, applause, like, from everyone, is we're united because we're divided. It's because we all agree that our fucking fierce autonomy. But that's what's kept them alive. That's why anarchism is still the corrective, because they've never been co-opted. Because by their nature, it, yeah, they, they are the fierce independence, which right now, in a police state of such fucking coerciveness, that is exactly the cure we need. The dose makes the poison, of course. Purity is poison, so... Whether we need a pure anarchistic state, which or the devolvement of the state, is something to be debated scientifically. But we, they, there is insight. I, it's, just, it's such fucking, it's a breath of fresh air just reading that shit, which goes along with my experience. Experiential. Puerto Rico, very anarchistic. So this island, Vieques, is the island supposedly Columbus land on. There's a uh, sabre tree there that's over 500 years old. So um, there's this reggae band from the island, wrote the song, Seba Quinienton. In Ghana, was it? Something, something like that. It's some ah fucking it. My friend, she she knows the whole song, but it's good. Seba Quinienton, five hundred year old Seba tree that saw it all. Uh, Puerto, Columbus landed on Puerto Rico. Uh, he probably landed on Vieques. Vieques and Culebra are two islands off the coast of the Puerto Rico, from to the right to the um, east. And um, who else? Uh, what's his name? Um, Simon Bolivar landed on Vieques in order to resupply during his revolutions in Venezuela, and that would be on Caracas Beach. They call it Caracas. The, um, what is the history of Vieques? It has the oldest fort in the Western Hemisphere, or the, the, the last built fort, so actually the newest fort in the Western Hemisphere. It was built by the Spanish uh, in the late 1800s, um, and I think supposedly a Spanish queen built her castle there. Somewhere in the brush, maybe it's lost. A lot of Vieques is just jungly vines. Um, and then the Spanish-American War, well, no, we'll go back. Uh, Columbus was in Puerto Rico cutting off uh, the natives' hands. He, Their natives were called Tainos. They greeted Columbus and said, Taino means uh, honorable, good. They said, we're Taino, we're good. We're not like the Caribs to the south who steal our wives and our cannibals. And the hurricanes come from the south. Bad shit goes down there. Don't go down there. We're cool. They invented hammocks. They um, they had these little casiga systems of uh, like federal rule of like little communes all over the place. Very happy, peaceful people. And so Columbus writes in his journal, these people are such idiots. We can fucking pacify them all with like 20 men and guns, which he proceeds to do. They flee to the hills. They hunt them down. Most of them get exterminated, but most Puerto Ricans have Taino blood in them. So just like Neanderthals, maybe we kill them all, but maybe they survive through our genetic makeup. Really good genes, too. You go down there. 80-fucking-year-old cab driver just driving me around, telling me how he has a 50-year-old girlfriend, and he's fucking working in his farm every day. There is some very good genetic makeup. Well, just fucking Miss America athletes. Puerto Rico, the Tainos were strong, strong people. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so after that, 1500s, 1600s, you have the Dutch, the British, and the Spanish all fighting over these islands, including Vieques. Uh, 
during the Spanish-American War. Oh, so the British called it Crab Island because there's so many crabs that they said that it would look like the coast is moving. That's how many crabs were on there. And you still go crabbing over there. After the rains, the crabs come out of their holes looking for new holes. So you wait a couple days after the rain, and the water in their holes heat up, and so they leave because it's uncomfortable looking for new holes. So after the rain, about two or three days, you call it the crabs are running, and then you go crabbing. They used to, culebra, a culebra is a snake in Spanish. They used to have a lot of snakes. But then they introduced mongoose to kill all the snakes. And they did that. But now there's a mongoose problem. And they also decimated the bird population. So there's this Puerto Rican parrot, which I believe is endangered now. A really beautiful parrot. The Iecas used to have a lot of parrots. Now has a lot of mongoose. Used to have a lot of snakes. Not anymore. Has a lot of iguanas. I don't think those are indigenous. Maybe some caimans. Caimans are like crocodiles. There's some on the mainland. I've never seen one on Vieques, but they say there's some. Um, so the Spanish built their last fort there when it was in Spanish hands in the late 1800s. Uh, and then uh, the freaking... I have a map of it being uh, part of the British territories, actually, I think. Oh, fuck. Did I lose that map? Hopefully I kept it in my apartment. And then the Spanish-American War, we... Um, we got, uh, that was 19, 1898, we got Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Um, so that's when you had the Battle of San Juan Hill. And um, we basically, we, um, oh, so the Spanish were using it as a fort because, oh, I didn't even mention the pirates, the pirates of the Caribbean. So we have Monte Pirata on Vieques, which is the highest point on Vieques. And you can see the trade going in and out of the New World. So if you look on a map, Vieques is right in the middle between the Greater Antilles and the Lesser Antilles. The Greater Antilles are the islands to the north in the Caribbean. That's, you have Jamaica, Hispaniola, which one side is Haiti, the other side is Dominican Republic. And then you have Puerto Rico, and you have Bahamas to the north. So those are the four island groups of the Greater Antilles. And then as you get, Vieques is right off the coast of Puerto Rico, so the last Greater Antilles. And then everything to the right, or to the east and south of Vieques, is the Lesser Antilles. And that's too many islands for me to, it'd be cool to memorize them. And that's when I was down there, I was like, this is a whole lifetime. Just, I was trying to look at geography. I was like, you could just fucking sail from island to island. Yeah, the British Virgin Islands. Uh, they were like, they're called the American Virgin Islands or the Spanish Virgin Islands. Vieques and Culebra, uh, St. Croix. And then you have like all the way down, you have like Guadalupe, you have St. Vincent, the Grenadines and all that. And there's a whole bunch of islands going all the way down to Trinidad and Tobago right above uh, South America. And those are all the Lesser Antilles. When the hurricanes come, they come off, there's dry air off of Africa, off the Sahara. It meets the humid air off of the uh, Ad was it Atlantic. And then that creates the hurricane uh, systems, which then come up the Lesser Antilles, up the east coast of the United States. Depending on where that's created, it'll either come low on the Lesser Antilles or high. So below Puerto Rico and Vieques or higher. Hurricane Maria went right through Vieques, literally. Cut a path right through it. Uh, people down there tell me there wasn't a leaf left on a tree. By the time it landed, it was a category four or five. So that was the worst one since Hugo. Um, yeah, and so uh, so the pirates would be on Monte Pirata watching the trade come and go from the n new world to the old, and then they'd go intercept it. And so Vieques was always a pirate island, and you feel that energy. It's Puerto Rico, the Spanish used as a fort, and that's why San Juan has two forts in San Juan, old San Juan, and it's pretty much a fortified city. And so when the United States attacked it during the Spanish-American War, they actually, the Puerto Ricans tell me they're very proud that the Americans had to come up to the south of Puerto Rico in order to take it over, but they couldn't take over San Juan straight on because it's a fortress city. But um, what I love about Vieques is Vieques is off the coast, and Vieques has always attracted the outcasts of civilization ever since the time of Columbus. The last raids on uh, Columbus and the Spanish, Ponce de Leon, were from Vieques. Casimar and Yarebo were two Indian chiefs who launched raids on Ponce de Leon's forces, and they killed his dog. And when they did that, then they raided Vieques and killed them all. And that's the history of empire, I guess, is um, the oppressed don't quite win, but we get moral victories.
But for those moral victories, we pay a very disproportionate price. And um, so they're the underdogs of the underdogs. And I felt that spirit, and I called it home for a little bit. We're going to talk more about it.